A verdict seven years in the making. John Chilcott has finally unveiled his long-awaited report on the Iraq war. He concludes that military action was not taken as a last resort and was made on the basis of flawed intelligence. I'll be talking through its opinions, findings and consequences with an array of experts, including the UN's former chief weapons inspector. Hello and welcome to the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. It's taken seven years and the verdict has been eagerly awaited by all but a few. Sir John Chilcott's report into the Iraq war has finally been published. It was based on dozens of witness interviews and 150,000 pages of evidence and has harsh words for many involved in the war. Thirteen years on from the initial invasion, Iraq remains in a state of chaos. Since foreign troops left the country in 2011, Iraq's government has fought various armed groups, including Daesh. So was the removal of Saddam Hussein the right decision? Or did it create a failed state? Today's newsmaker is the Chilcot Report as we ask what was behind the coalition's decision to invade Iraq. And here we gather tonight. It was a conflict that was both predictable and yet opposed by masses of people across the world. The planned invasion of Iraq was a slow-burning American fuse. When it occurred in March 2003, it was devastating. Coalition forces hit a senior Iraqi leadership compound last evening. That was the first. The days of the Saddam Hussein regime are numbered. The war drums had been beating in Washington and London for a long time. For President George W. Bush, Iraq and Saddam Hussein were a worrisome inherited problem. But the events of September the 11th, 2001, concentrated the minds within the Bush administration. The United States invaded Afghanistan to neutralize al-Qaeda. But in the eyes of the White House, there were three main threats to world peace. North Korea, Iran and Iraq. He called them collectively the axis of evil. In less than a year, the case for war appeared to have been made by the United States, but backed up by a loyal ally. Saddam Hussein is not disarming. He is uh, a danger to the world. This issue uh, will come to a head in a matter of weeks, not months. Not everyone agreed. Hans Blix led the UN's weapons inspection teams in Iraq for three years until June 2003, making the point that Iraq couldn't declare any banned weapons if they didn't have them. Inspection is not a prelude to war. It is an alternative to war. And that is what we want to achieve. But while one message came from the weapons inspectors, a stronger theme was emerging from Washington and London. They have to disarm. They have to cooperate with the inspectors. They're not doing it. If they don't do it through the UN route, then they will have to be disarmed by force. A few days later, a leading member of the Bush administration gave a long and impassioned speech at the United Nations. Every statement I make today is backed up by sources, solid sources. These are not assertions. What we're giving you are facts and conclusions based on solid intelligence. By then, the British government had its own facts, its own assertions. Today we published... A it produced two dossiers stating the case for war, including the claim that chemical and biological munitions could be with military units and ready for firing within 45 minutes. History showed us the intelligence was far from solid. Facts were elusive. Iraq had no apparent stockpiles of biological, chemical or nuclear weapons. The protests against war had mobilized people across the globe, including in Paris, where the government of Jacques Chirac had been strongly opposed to an invasion. For us, the use of force is a last resort, and we are not there yet. The sentiments were the same the world over, but achieved nothing. The United States, supported by Britain, seemingly had a determination to invade Iraq and end the rule of Saddam Hussein come what may. 
weapons of mass destruction or not, the war simply was going to happen. Francis Collins, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now in studio is Richard Butler. He was the UN's chief arms inspector in Iraq from 1997 to 1999. Sir, thank you very much for joining Pleasure. us. Pleasure. Everything we've heard today, Chilcot report comes out, Tony Blair launches a, a strong defense. Has this just confirmed that the invasion by the United States and its allies, particularly the, the United Kingdom, was, was wrong? It shouldn't have happened? Yes, it has. We've known for a long time that the reasons for doing this were false. Uh, the motives for it were mixed, to say the very least. And the Chilcot report is remarkable for the studied way in which it's picked its way carefully through the relevant data, but comes irretrievably to the conclusion that this was wrong, it should never have happened in the way that it did, and the outcomes of it have been appalling. He did once, Saddam Hussein, have weapons of mass yes. destruction. Are we absolutely clear that at the time of the invasion he did not have them? Yes, I think we are, Imran. Um, we had reported to the UN Security Council in my last report to the Council that we had destroyed, removed or rendered harmless, those were the words in the enabling resolution, his weapons of mass destruction with a few ambiguities with re regard to a small number of chemical shells and a couple of missile engines. Three years later, my successor in the new organization, Hans Blix, did exactly the same on the eve of the invasion. And I think that's what Chilcott meant when he said this was, military action should not have been a last resort. We should have given uh, the allies, so-called allies, should have given a better and further chance to more disarmament work to verify what we now know to be true, that there were no weapons of mass destruction. In those shades of grey, can it be possible that they were perhaps a little hopeful and that the, they just sort of focused on, on the evidence that seemed to make sense and, and ignored the rest of it. Was there enough in there for them to make a decision to go to war? I don't believe so and I don't think Chilcott did either. If you read carefully what he said in his statement today, I haven't of course read the whole two and a half million mm -hmm. words report, but if you listen carefully to what he said today, the answer to your question is no. What are these shades of grey? It's perfectly clear that the intelligence information made available to the government was manipulated. Because uh, you, say, you say this now, but I've got your testimony to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in 2002 where <coughs> I, I, I've read this over and over again and it seems quite clear with you as an expert that you seem to be suggesting to them that this guy's dangerous and he probably has those weapons of mass destruction? No, no. There were two questions at issue. One is the extent to which Saddam was in compliance with Security Council resolutions and allow us to finally verify that he had no WMD. Well, I've, I've got this here. I can, I can add it to you so, so I don't misquote yeah, sure. you. Right, there you go. Sure. I've got my own copy. You've, you've got yours. And what so I've we... highlighted a bit, right? So we've got July 31st, 2002. Mm -hmm. the, so the first paragraph I've got here. It is essential to recognize that the claim made by Saddam's representatives that Iraq has no WMD is false. Everyone concerned from Iraq's neighbors to the UN Security Council and the Secretary General of the UN with whom Iraq is currently negotiating on the issue is being lied to. So you're saying they're being lied to by Saddam Hussein, right? And right. on the final page, final little bit I've got here. On the elemental question of whether, contrary to assertions authorized by him, Saddam possesses WMD, I would refer to the traditional test of whether or not a person can be judged to have committed a crime. Did the accused have the motive, means, and opportunity? Saddam plainly has had and continues to have all three. So, so they're relying on you and the experts to build a case. For me, you're leaving little doubt. You're hardly being cautious. They're going, Richard Butler's telling us, this guy's got the goods and we've got to go after them. Am I, am I reading this wrong? No, I don't think you are. Um, the distinction I was trying to draw a moment ago is between whether or not the weapons existed and our ability to verify their presence or absence. Saddam, as I reported in the last instance to the Security Council, and I, it would appear also to the Senate here, mm -hmm. had never allowed us to do the latter. All right? He sought to avoid providing the information that we needed to mm -hmm. verify the absence of WMD. Um, 
Now, whether or not he still had them, uh, I'm saying there that I believe that he did. Mm -hmm. um, in answer to the questions that are uh, covered now right. by the Chilcot inquiry, uh, I think we now know that he did not, and that's why they didn't find them. But do you, in retrospect, regret that perhaps you were a bit bullish on that? Um, possibly. I'd have to go back and look mm -hmm. at the context. Tony Blair has been speaking. Um, he says the intelligence was not falsified and the decision was made in good faith. His words exactly. Do you believe him? I believe what he says about himself and his good faith. I've just, before coming to you now here on the set, I've just watched extensively his statement in London and he repeatedly says, trust me, I was, I'm an honest man. I did what I did with the best of intentions. Um, I'm not going to comment on that other than to say I believe he believes that of himself. What needs to be judged instead of intentions is what the reality was. And I think it is demonstrable that the intelligence information was manipulated. Chilcott makes that perfectly plain. It is demonstrable that Tony Blair wanted to join the United States in an invasion of Iraq planned months before the invasion actually took place. Um, it is also demonstrable that the effects of that invasion have been a disaster. Need I go on? I think what is at issue here is a fairly hallowed principle that whatever you do, you should do for the right reasons. And I think there's an absence of right reasons here, notwithstanding mm -hmm. the faith that Blair says he has in himself and his own judgment. And going back finally to your own personal role, do you regret that perhaps they used your testimony as an enabling factor to go to war? Because there wasn't enough in there that said, be careful, be cautious, we don't, we don't know. I agree with the last thing you've said. Uh, I don't know the use to which they put this. Uh, I'll go away and read this again and think about it. I don't know the use to which they put it. I do know the use to which they put intelligence information that was provided to them in good faith, which Chilcott refers mm -hmm. to uh, senior intelligence people expressing concerns to Blair and his government about the uses to which they would put this intelligence. Um, and I know that their good faith was abused and that intelligence was distorted. Uh, the death of David Kelly, for example, who was my senior biologist, mm -hmm. demonstrates that when he was exposed as the person who said to a representative of the media that they had asked him, and these were his words, to sex up the dossier to make it m easier to uh, stage an invasion, um, he was found dead a few days later. He was so distressed by, by what had happened, a wonderful man. Now, in the wider scheme of things, that was small beer in comparison with what then happened in Iraq. But I mention it because I think it's an example of the pressures that there were upon experts and intelligence officials to come up with a justification Did you feel under pressure? The, oh yes, I felt a lot of pressure and I resisted a lot of it. Um, I sometimes joke that I'm sure the CIA has got a fat file on me because, you know, they ask me to take into account certain considerations frequently and I refuse to because my job was to try and find the facts about the weapons, not to do other things. Uh, yes, I felt the pressure. I think many, many people did. Mm. Um, obviously, Tony Blair did too. Why he thought it was so important to promise George Bush that he would never let him down, that he would, what were his words, he would follow him mm -hmm. wherever, yeah. was is something that I think the British people should think about. Yeah, he, he, he said he would, he would be with him, uh, whatever, and that was in but how extraordinary yes. to, pledge, to pledge your government's mm -hmm. foreign policy on a permanent basis to the service of another. Mm -hmm. And look at where it's got us. So it's been fascinating talking to you, Ambassador Richard Butler. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Let's dig a little deeper on the key findings of the Chilcot report. In a moment, I'll be analyzing its conclusions with two guests from London. We have Muafak al Rubai, an Iraqi MP who was the country's national security advisor during the American occupation. And also joining us is Stephen Bell from Stop the War Coalition. But first, here's a breakdown of the report by Yvette McCullough. The judgments about the severity of the threat were presented with a certainty that was not justified. Iraq 
has chemical and biological weapons, which could be activated within 45 minutes. Military action at that time was not a last resort. If we are right, as I believe with every fibre of instinct and conviction I have that we are, and we do not act, that is something history will not forgive. Flawed intelligence, inadequate planning, and no imminent threat. Those are just some of the findings of an inquiry into the UK's invasion of Iraq in 2003. The 2.6 million word report by John Chilcott found that the UK chose to invade before all peaceful options had been exhausted. It also says the UK undermined the authority of the UN Security Council and that the evidence for weapons of mass destruction and nuclear capabilities wasn't proven beyond doubt. It is now clear the policy on Iraq was made on the basis of flawed intelligence and assessments. They were not challenged, and they should have been. The report found that planning for what happened after the toppling of Saddam Hussein was wholly inadequate, and that British forces in Iraq were ill-equipped. The British Prime Minister at the time, Tony Blair, says he accepts responsibility for mistakes, but says he did what he thought was right at the time. There were no lies. Parliament and Cabinet were not misled. There was no secret commitment to war. Intelligence was not falsified and the decision was made in good faith. The report didn't look at the legality of the war, but it could make it easier for punishment in the future. And for many in the UK and in Iraq, there's still a strong desire to see someone held to account. Yvette McCullough, The Newsmakers. OK, let's bring in our guest, Stephen Bell. Uh, many expected a whitewash of sorts. Well, this was certainly not a whitewash. Do you feel vindicated? I think it is stronger than many anticipated, uh, but it is certainly a vindication of the millions of people who opposed uh, the uh, Britain's war upon Iraq, and certainly a vindication of the politicians and the anti-war movement generally who um, organized that uh, uh, opposition. Okay, let's bring in the Iraqi politician, Muafak Rabai. The war wasn't justified from a UK perspective. That's the general feeling today after the Chilcot report comes out. What do you think? Well, we sit in Iraq, uh, uh, the, the perception is uh, this is all semantic discussion uh, and it's all uh, splitting, splitting hairs. Uh, we, we're, uh, we, we, the report uh, has missed uh, huge uh, uh, points. Number one is, uh, uh, was the war, uh, was, it, was the, the, war, the reason behind the war was a noble reason? Uh, yes, removing Saddam was a low, noble cause. This is not, number two. The, the, what the, the report also is missing what happened the, in the aftermath of the war. The country was left, left in an absolute total vacuum and they did not act after the war in a responsible way. Okay, and you say they didn't act in a responsible way. You were part of the Iraqi government, part of uh, Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki's state of law coalition. Uh, it's well known now, empirically proven, that he ruled in a sectarian fashion that drove many young Sunnis into the hands of Daesh. The country is a complete mess at the moment, should the Iraqi politicians not be taking some of the responsibility for this now and not just blaming the United States and its allies for leaving? Well, the, uh, the, Iraqis, the Iraqi politicians also uh, share some of the blame, but we were under occupation. And the, and the United Nations Security Council resolution has authorized the occupier, whether the Brit Britain or US, they have authorized, they've given them the whole authority in, in to, to security decision, economic decision, political decision on the country until the end of 2011. So the Iraqi politicians were trying to uh, push some of their Iraqi interests through the occupation interests, if you like. And the, the, the occupying power was 
uh, really they, they didn't understand the country, the cultural, the language, the religion, the sectarian issue. They didn't understand anything of the uh, of the of the country. The complexity of yeah, Iraq. But these, these, is, again, were not Mr. Rubai, these policies were from Prime Minister Nouri al Maliki. These 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 were not from. George W. Bush, or Barack Obama, or, or Tony Blair, or Gordon Brown. These policies were from Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki. They were not from the outside. Uh, you are totally and absolutely wrong. The sectarian issue was implanted by Saddam Hussein. He, ruled, he, he tried to rule by the minority to prevail on the on the country which is the majority are the Shia. Now this has this the, okay. the root of sectarianism was Saddam Hussein time. Okay. Now after the war, when you lift the when you lift the the cover of this pressure cook, if you like, of course it will. Okay. So and leave so, the so you're making the argument vacuum. for the anti war group. Of course it will explode. Group here. You're making the argument for the anti war group. Let me then move it on to to Stephen Bell. Stephen Bell, you believe that the war wasn't just or justified, but do you believe that once they were in, even though you disagree with the war, once they were in, they could have handled things better, Stephen Bell? They could have hardly handled them worse. I mean, disbanding the Iraqi army and the uh, debathification debath uh, program meant that there was no effective authority anywhere um, in uh, uh, Iraq. But this was because, this lack of planning was because the decisive question for them was the removal of the uh, regime. This was the lie which was sold to the British people. We were told that it was not about regime change, it was about an immediate threat to um, the uh, British people by uh, Saddam's uh, arsenal and the possibility of this arsenal being handed over to terrorists, etc., etc. Chilcott was um, completely withering uh, on this, and we now know that not, you know, right. what the anti-war movement said at the time. We now has, has now been officially confirmed from the British establishment itself. Stephen Bell, would you be happy with Saddam Hussein sticking around and him being in power and not being removed? I would have been much happier if the decision on Iraq's government was taken solely by the people of Iraq rather than people in London and Washington who, as your esteemed guest said, have zero understanding of uh, Iraqi society. And unfortunately, Iraq is not um, a, a simple uh, one-off. We have also seen the destruction of Libya um, uh, through a comparable policy. Okay. This whole report was set up in order to learn the lessons. Unfortunately, it took seven years to produce, during which right. time they embarked upon another adventure. Okay, I want a final comment from Wafa Karubai. 13 years on from that invasion, we have a, a, a democracy with sectarianism, a, do, a democracy without security for, for many Iraqis. Your second largest city is occupied by a death cult. Is there any good news in Iraq? Is there any silver lining in the year 2016? If there is, give it to me. Uh, there is definitely a very good uh, news from Iraq in, uh, in 2016. We have re retaken most of the territories uh, the Daesh has occupied in, in June 2014. We, we, we're enjoying uh, most of the most of Iraq actually in the 11 or or 12 provinces are enjoying a very good peaceful uh, and quite a good security in these uh, and the, the economy we have we've gone over the worst uh, economic or financial crisis of last year 2015 and we are heading to a, a much better economy uh, for 2017 we uh, now we have established uh, a, a very good constitutional parliamentary system in place in Iraq. We have uh, election after election. We have prime minister after prime minister. Uh, had, had we just imagined the, uh, the, uh, the horrible dream, if you like, if we leave Saddam, if you have left Saddam Hussein in place, we would have ended up with exactly a scenario like Syrian scenario or Libyan scenario. While we have now uh, most of Iraq under uh, well secured and the prosperous and uh, and uh, I, I agree there are there are a lot. Of I think by saying do, most of Iraq is secure have, and prosperous, I feel like we're going to have to have an entirely new show on that because that sounds. 
open up to much, much debate. But unfortunately, we are out of time. Wafa Karabai and Stephen Bell, thank you both of you for joining us. Always a pleasure. Today's newsmaker has been the Chilcot Report. As we asked what was behind the coalition's decision to invade Iraq, tens of thousands of lives were lost and a country was left in ruins. The key verdict of his report is that these consequences were foreseeable and preventable. And the decision to go to war was made before all peaceful options had been exhausted and on the basis of flawed intelligence. The British Prime Minister at the time, Tony Blair, says he acted in good faith, but he takes full responsibility for the mistakes. But for many, these small words of contrition are too little and far too late. You've been watching this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Imran Garta. As always, thank you for watching. Bye-bye. Resolution 1441 gave Iraq one last chance to come into compliance or to face serious consequences. clear that policy on Iraq was made on the basis of flawed intelligence and assessments.